Welcome to another day of CS219. Hope you all had a good weekend. Oh, there's like a light flicker. <clears throat> cool. There we go. So, uh, I don't hear any audio, but I'm going to assume it's just because you guys are not speaking at all. But uh, cool, cool, cool. So, um, on the... Last Friday, you guys went to the TA, and I, I did see the recording of that, so... Uh, I know that he covered Amdom's, Amdal's Law, Little's Law, and then Cycles, uh, million of, of instructions per second, and then Cycles per instruction. So uh, I'll go very fast for that since, since I did kind of mention Amdal's Law already. And I don't, the only thing I, I don't think he mentioned was speed of factor. Oh, he also did, yes, he did the arithmetic mean, geometric mean, and harmonic mean. And by the way, uh, he he did talk about how in geometric mean you have the two different means different ways of computing it One of them is the multiplications and then the other one is using uh, Logarithms and summation, but that's better for us because we don't want to overflow because multiplication can become very very big very fast and maintaining the result is pretty big so uh, One of the ways that they get around that is by by modifying how they compute it and the advantage of uh, Geometric mean is that like he said it is less sensitive to outliers. Uh, one of the things that he did mention, uh, but he knows we just didn't mention it, is uh, with uh, harmonic mean, the advantage of using harmonic mean over the other two is when you're dealing with fractions and multiples and those kinds of things. So if, uh, if, you, if, you wanna, if you wanna read more about that, I think it also mentions it on the book that, that that's what the advantage of geometric mean is. So one of the reasons why they cover uh, averaging is because as as the TA mentioned in his example when when you're trying to compute how long a, prog a program takes you you can't do it as a factor of time like time is not it doesn't really work here what you want to do is number of instructions because some computers may be faster than other ones depending on the on the clock cycle and things like that so it's, it's a very hard to just put a chronometer and, and be like okay I'm gonna run this program and see how long it takes. And now I'm gonna run it in that computer and see how long it takes because there can be so many other factors. So you have to go a little bit more, more deeper than that. And one of the things that you can do, first of all, is to see, to see uh, how fast the program is, is you can figure out, uh, if, you, if you go down to the, to the lowest level possible, you know, we have, like, like we have different operations that you can do, like loading stuff, storing stuff, doing arithmetic and things like that. And so, you know, some of those instructions may take more than one clock cycle. Now, what's a clock cycle? I think that we need to make sure, I mean, this, this should have been covered in like CP100, but let's make sure we understand what a clock cycle is. Uh, and it, you know, it's not just a review. So, uh, you, normally when you are looking at like a CPU book or one of those things, you see sort of this little graph here. And what it represents, it's no current, current. And it can be zero, one, or it could be one, zero, depending on what you consider as no current. Because some people say like zero is a closed circuit, so that means current. Other people say zero means no current, and then one means uh, a current. So I'm going to go with the zero means no current, and one means current. And so the uh, the valleys and, 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 thur and thoroughs, as they call them, I think, throughs. I can't remember what the word is for that. Um, but basically, you know, it, it, it makes a mountain and, va and valley kind of thing, you know, mountain valley. And so... Why do we need to do this? Because when we have something like a logic gate, you know, a logic gate is going to take, I don't know which one this is. I think this is an and. Um, actually, no. You know, this just literally came back to me like right now. Uh, I wasn't remember the other day, but I think this one you draw like this. And so that's an and actually. I think this is an or. Uh, yeah. Wow. This just literally flew into my mind. Perfect. But I think that's right. Okay. So. You know, when an AND gate, you know, one and one will give you a one, right? But, like, what if you need to switch this to be zero? You know, if, if you just have current on these cables, you know, you have to lower it down to zero. And that takes time. That takes time to actually lower that currency. So what this really looks like, it's like a little sine wave. You know, it, 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 we wish it would look like this, but you can't just switch things on immediately. Speed of light has speed. Like, there's a, we talked about that the other day. So what this really looks like is more like this. 
you know, here we got the zero, here we got the one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. But it takes time for us to go from the zero state to the one state. That actually is, is computable time. And that is going to be how long a cycle takes. Because going from there to there, you know, if you have a, 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 a slow, uh, and by the way, how do they make these vibrations? They, they typically use a quartz cycle or a quartz crystal. And that quartz crystal is basically vibrating, right? It's the same thing they're using the watch to keep time, but just a faster one. And every vibration is one of these. And so when you're trying to switch over from zero to one, that changing current takes time to propagate. And, you know, the closer the circuits are, the faster that you can do that. You know, from where you change the electricity to where it's got to get, you know, that's a distance, right? So, like, let's say this is zero and this is one, and, and you want a one to be fed here. You know, you're feeding it a zero right now, and so you switch it to a one, whoop, and then when you do that, that you could think of that almost instant. However, that signal has to get over here, and how that's going to look like, it's going to look like this, okay? And so, when you have a like a like a very fast clock cycle, what it means is it can switch faster from zero to, to one. And because it can do that, you know, let's say that, you know, we had a, 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 a slow one hertz machine. That means that it, it will take one second to switch over from a zero to one. So if I wanted to, to, to do an instruction with an AND gate and I needed to switch, you know, one of the wires to one, it's going to take one second for me to be able to switch it. Okay. And so because of that, the fastest that I can and do operations is one per second. Now, if I have a two hertz machine, then it's going it, to, you know, it's going to be technically half a second because you say divide it. And so if I have that, then I can do twice the number of switchings in, in one second than they could before. So because of that, I can feed more instructions at a time. Now, if, if, even if my, imagine my processor was super fast and, and computed things in less than a second. If I can't feed it information, you know, by switching this thing from zero to once as necessary, faster than that, then it, th this is useless. This is literally useless. If it, if it takes one nanosecond to compute, to do an operation, but I can't feed it information that fast because I can't switch my cable because it's so slow at switching, then I'm limited by that. So that's why when people overclock and make the computers faster, basically shortening the amount of time that it takes for them to be able to switch from ones to zeros, which means that you get more of these little ups and downs, which means that you can feed more instructions at the same amount of time, and the processor can handle it. However, the, the moment you start doing that, it's a lot of power to be able to switch that back and forth like that, because you're feeding it more electricity in a short period of time, per se, and that will generate tons of heat, which is why you need extra cooling, as I was talking about the other day. So anyways, hopefully this is a little bit of a, a refresher from, uh, from what clock cycle is, okay? So any, any questions on that? Okay, cool. So then, um, what was I saying with this? Uh, well, okay, so, so, so we know that some operations may require more, multiple instructions to be able to, to, to achieve, or multiple cycles per instruction, sorry. Why is that the case? Well, because an instruction may be made up of other, of different little operations, which we'll talk about later today. Like you have to fetch the opcode, fetch the address of, of like, let's say, you're, let's say you're loading something from a variable, you know? The first thing you gotta do is you gotta fetch the instruction that it says load, the basically load five. And then the next thing you do is you look at the instruction and you gotta decode it. So you gotta actually figure out, you know, cause it doesn't, it doesn't say in English load five, it says it in binary and the computer needs to know what that binary represents. So it has to do that fetching as well. And then now it knows that it, it's supposed to load and the five is an address in memory. So now it needs to go in memory, find out what's in five and then bring it into the accumulator register. That's gonna take time as well. And now you're finally done with that instruction. The next instruction might be uh, to load another variable or to add something to that, what you, whatever you loaded in the accumulator. So the instruction might be add, add this address. And what that will do is add whatever is in this address with the accumulator. So yet again, the first thing you do is it's got a, there's a program counter, which we'll mention later, but it, that goes up by one. So it loads that instruction and, and then it has to decode the instruction figure out what that is what I basically said, then go to that address, get that number, do the addition in the accumulator, and store the result in the accumulator. And so that is that might also take more than, than, uh, than one cycle because there's a lot of different things that are happening. The course is constantly switching the clock cycle, or is the clock cycle at zero until you have an instruction? So the course is constantly uh, switching the, the cycle on and off because what ends up happening is 
you know, you, you are expecting it potentially to be like this. However, if it's different, you know, that's because uh, you received a signal. And so that's when you can detect the signal. There's also something between synchronous and asynchronous stuff. But yes, the, the quartz is vibrating, but you don't have to be switching back and forth. Like you can make this into a one. However, you think of it this way. This, this is a good way to explain it. So, so you're only looking at the zeros. You're not looking at the ones per se. However, you can switch this to a one and then you know that that is intentional or you can leave it at a zero. So depending on what you leave it as, it, you can basically do that. But yeah, it's switching back and forth, but you can control that by, by sort of blocking it out or then or letting it give you a signal. So yes, and it depends on the, on the machine. It's been like I said, synchronous or synchronous. And it's, it's a whole, uh, yeah, it, it gets deeper than that. But just for us, you know, that, that's more than enough to, to kind of remember. And so be, because you have different, uh, clock cycles, you know, it, it's easier to better to, to see how long a program takes if we think about how many cycles it requires. And then, yes, if we have a faster, gig, you know, faster hertz, more clock cycle, faster clock, clock cycle rate, then yes, we can run the computer faster. Now, if you really care about real world application benchmarking, uh, well, that's, first of all, that's what it's called. If you want to really time, you know, like real application of computers and timing, then yes, we do care about time. And for that, we have things like benchmarking. And uh, some of the popular benchmarkings are uh, well. There's a there's a uh, there's a there's like of course there's going to be some sort of company that does this sort of benchmarking standardization. It is called the Standard Performance Evaluation Corporation, and it offers like a dozen of different possible benchmarks available. Whether you want like CPU, uh, graphics cards, uh, hard drives, like read write stuff. Like when you go to Amazon and you're trying to look for an SSD. A lot of the people in the comments, like they have this picture of stuff like read and write that they run a program. That's what we want with benchmarking because it's useful to us as a consumer. What, or even 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 if just any kind of consumer, yeah. Whether you're you're in the in the like an individual or a company, you you care about being able to compare how fast is this read and how fast is this write compared to these other companies. And so it's good to have a standard that everybody can, can kind of run that because at, at, from a company's point of view, they can run it. But there's also individual company, individual, like not just companies, but people that make their own benchmarking. So, um, you know, in fact, what they do is they typically will join that consortium of the of spec standard performance evaluation corporation. And uh, sometimes, of course, because it's all about making money, some of these benchmarks are not free. So. The professional ones, the ones that are, are going to be followed by like, I don't know, I'm just going to throw the name OSHA because I'm assuming that they're so, they always have a standard for everything, so they don't really do for this stuff, even though OSHA is mostly for health. You know, they will have a standard and then a company will look at these standards, whereas we can go on Amazon and look at the pictures that people ran. But some people, somebody could have doctored that image, right? And uh, Or even the program itself that they were using could have been messed with. This is more of like a big standard for, uh, the, you know, somebody that these guys came up with. And it's not free because they, they monitor and, and they change it every uh, every five years. And so uh, one of the ones that I have here, for example, was Spec CPU 2006 uh, combines performance of CPU memory and compiler, and is used to compute intensive workloads on different computing systems. And basically that kind of thing. There's also server side uh, benchmarks that you can run on a computer, and uh, and yeah, there's also also make sure you remember the idea of response time, which is like from when you tell a computer to do something to when it actually does something. That's another part of benchmarking that's pretty important, but also how much data can be flow. Because here's the thing, um, you could have an SSD or a hard drive or a USB flash drive that does something like, you know, three gigabits per second or something, something really nice, okay? Like you have this really, really fast thing. However, there's a catch. It takes 10 seconds for the first like byte to transfer. And then once it gets going, then it goes really, really fast. But that initial like hurdle, you know, might be really slow. So what may end up happening is like, yeah, you have this super, super fast drive, but there's this long sort of start startup time. So that will be kind of like the response time. And then we also have the thorough put, which is that, that sort of flow once things get going. Uh, for example, if you have a camera, you know, a camera, that initial delay time is okay as long as you don't run out of what 
like the buffer or whatever this information has to be put in before it can kind of flow into the into the camera card so a lot of times what happens with those cameras is yeah they can read in all these photos but because of that initial sort of load up time you can only take that many pictures at, at once before you the, the the shutter like slows down to allow the data to flow right so it's important to think about that in terms of benchmarking as well so uh anyways I think that's kind of enough about benchmarking. So going back to the book, um, pipelining, they start talking about pipelining and branch prediction. Uh, I think it will make more sense to talk about pipelining once we once I talk about in 3.2, which is what I really want to focus on today. Cause that's, that's, I think that's the most important section of, uh, so far between chapters two and three. So when I talk about that, it'll make more sense about pipelining, but branch prediction, we already kind of, give you a brief idea on and we will talk more about it uh, one of the terms that I, we haven't talked about but it's mentioned here is superscalar because we talked about at some point in like what was it like the 90s or 2000s they added super i think it's thousands yeah they added superscalar abilities to the intel chips and so superscalar is uh the ability to issue more than one instruction in every processor clock cycle so in one of those little mountains you can issue more than one instruction um in effect, you have basically multiple pipelines. Now, that doesn't mean your, your CPU is processing more than one instruction per cycle. It just means that you can create more instructions like that. Why would you want to do that? Well, again, if you have two cores, you want to generate potentially uh, one instruction for each of those and that kind of thing. Um, so, yes. Now, um, one of the things that they do mention here in, in, in 2.1 is that while Moore's law, you know, is great and all for, uh, for, for CPUs and with memory, the increase of transistors for DRAM, which stands for dynamic random access memory has made things go uh, faster. One of the places where we are having sort of issues making things faster is in that communication between the different devices. So basically when you were trying to communicate between like a, you know, the RAM and the CPU, that place can be, uh, that kind of like the, the, bottleneck as they call it and that will be the system bus so one of the ways that you can do kind of improve things is by making it wider which means that you can transmit more information at the same time which this kind of results in being if you have 32-bit memory you and you can transfer one 32-bit memory at a certain time that's not that good but it's okay if you can transfer 64 bits it means you can transfer two hours at a time now you're making things faster so you want wider not deeper uh system bus now we have a question i wonder how hard it is to write an objective benchmark program um i would assume that it's not hard if you're doing just your own test because i mean you can I mean heck I, I could put a for loop and just like you know make it run like a thousand times and then in, in that for loop i can do like two multiplications right and there you go that's a benchmark because then i can give that to my neighbor and have it run on, on his computer you know so, you know, we could all actually use any of the, of the assignments from uh, like 302 where you're doing like bubble sort, you know. Actually, we do our own benchmarking in 302 when we don't know the different sorting algorithms and then uh, we time them, you know. That's benchmarking because uh, we're timing them in a way. However, that's not very precise or amazing benchmarking per se. And uh, there's also compiler stuff involved. You know how our, each compiler compiles code is it exactly the same code that we're really really running you know even in the same architecture the compiler might be doing weird things like we don't know so i would say that writing a benchmark is not hard writing a benchmark that actually is useful and standardized and handles things best that will be a little bit trickier so but yes we definitely did a lot of sorting uh in trio to indeed that was fun times um, so anyways, back to the system bus, that's going to be kind of our bottleneck that hasn't really done much in form of improvement. And I think that's what they mentioned as well here. Uh, performance balancing, a system architecture can attack this problem in a number of ways. I think that's when they're talking about the pathways. Um, okay, so that was that. Is there anything else I want to say? this I guess there's a mention here on 2.2 about GPUs which I'm sure you all are aware of GPUs are more of a popular thing nowadays because of gaming so most of you know what a GPU is graphical processing unit and it has to do with floating point calculations and 
it's its own little race, you know, there between AMD and and uh, in, and Nvidia, which are the top of the line uh, things. However, one of the things that AMD was very uh, smart about introducing was the idea of a CPU that was both a graphical processing unit and a CPU. Uh, when they introduced sort of like their integrated system where the same chip had both the GPU and CPU in it I forget what it was called the first one they did but back then people were like wow, this is amazing or something um, It's called uh, what, are, what are they? I don't, I don't know but General purpose computing on GPU. No, I don't know. But anyways, they introduced it at some point and it was cool, but now, now it's like everybody has that because there's integrated core, integrated graphics cards and all these things. Uh, APU? APU? Maybe. I don't know. No, no, no. It might actually be that because uh, I don't know. You guys can Google it and figure out. It's, a, it's almost a marketing term mostly, but there's a thing for, especially for like laptops. That was really cool. Uh, but anyways, well, you guys figure that out. So then, then we went into MDOS law. So um, the only thing I want to mention in addition to what the TA said is there's also speed up, which I'm not sure if you quite exactly mentioned, but it's basically time to execute a program on a single processor. So when you're talking about the speed up of something, a speed up factor, like how fast can, how, like when you have a program and your boss is like, make it faster. And you're like, we already have like the best possible computer that we can do this in that's like, a, like one processor. And then your next step is like to parallelize. Then you're like, okay, if I parallelize this and feed it into a data center that has X amount of nodes, how fast can I actually get if I have like the ideal scenario? And the ideal scenario is you want to compute here the time to execute on a single processor. So that's how long it's taking your super fast computer that's just, just one processor, it's sequential, divided by the time to execute on n parallel processors n being the number of parallel processors that you need and so what you find out is that if, if you put an MDOS law on here there's a limit there's a limit on how fast you can get before the increase is, is just ever ever decreasing to just about nothing and so at that point you know you might be like okay in my specific situation you know, three three nodes or, or three three cores, you know, that's gonna still give me some good increase. Four, you know, it's starting to kind of level out. Five, it's not really uh, increasing anymore. And then six, seven, eight, they're all about the same. There's very little increase, like, like super small. So at that point, I would say that somewhere between four and five, probably five in this case would be kind of the, uh, the limit to that, at which point I'm not really gaining anything. In fact, you know, they don't really mention it here, but you can actually start to go down, uh, back back down into making things slower because if you have so many cores or so many nodes, if you're dealing with a supercomputer, that means the nodes, the difference between kind of cores and nodes is that when you think about a node, you're thinking about its own individual, like computer, CPU, RAM and whatnot, and that's a little CPU. And then you have another one here, but they're not essentially in the same case, which means you gotta communicate between them over like potentially an ethernet wire. And so that's going to be very slow. So if you have, and, and, and they're called slave and master nodes, and the master node is the one that sort of starts things out and, and organizes all the all the slave nodes. And so the master node usually sends the slaves the pieces of information that they're all going to run. Now, ideally, when you're talking about multi-core and one chip, that communication time is not bad at all. But if you have different nodes. You know, you have to actually send information over the cable, potentially over the Ethernet across the data center in the building. Uh, even if it's just like here and here, that is a very long distance, as we saw in electricity terms, like that can be a pretty long time. And so if I have to send it to all these things and I'm, I'm supposed to be splitting it and things like that, it's just going to make things a lot slower to the point where it starts to actually degrade performance because of that. Um, so, yeah. It's not always not good to just throw more cores at a problem or more nodes at a problem. So they have a picture on 2.4 that kind of shows an example of that. So maybe I can pull it up here. Uh, let's see. Figures chapter two. 
here here's an example number of processors in the speed up you can see it can never uh you know it, it can never just keep going forever there has to be a limitation to this oh here's a little quartz crystal analog to digital converter that's actually a nice picture and then anything else from here that's about little's law which i the one you really want to know is amdahl's law that's the that's the important one that's the one that i'm definitely gonna oh hold on i didn't show you guys i'm sorry my apologies so this is this is an example of the speed up kind of limiting you know um and then this is an example of quartz going from uh, analog to a digital conversion which is kind of a nice picture and here's uh processor trends so you know you can see that we uh we basically kept the number of cores the same until about 2003 ish maybe and that's when your general consuming started to go with multi-core so that pretty much was the same and now it's going up on the other hand transistors you can see it's increasing but here this is sort of like cheating again because we have multiple cores it's no longer a single core frequency you can see that it limited out in the early 2000s that's when we first reached two gigahertz like I have a computer that back there that came out that uh, that I got in 2005 and it's already I think at like two gigahertz or one gigahertz I think it's two and they still sell computers nowadays that are one or two gigahertz so you can see that that kind of we reached that limit because of the amount of heat that it generates and that's and a lot of power to the electricity it's not very eco-friendly when you got to feed in like you know a thousand watts just to kind of get the thing going and then it also generates a thousand watts of heat which can be kind of nasty and here you can see that the power goes up as the frequency goes up and then when we kind of level out here we kind of have to level out here so yeah uh, let me move the chat up here so i can see it better yeah, so sorry, I wasn't showing you the picture before, but now you see it. Um, so anyways, see if I can get to the, and by the way, uh, cycles per instruction, again, when you're computing that, the TA1 over that, um, again, you have to kind of average things out when you, when you, because you have different instructions that take different amount of time. And so if you have on average 5,000, you know, cause, cause your programs, you know, your program might have a bunch of floating point calculations, but it might also have a regular integer calculations, right? But it might vary, you know, every time you're on the program, it might have different amount of computations depending on the numbers that you feed it and things like that. So that's again, when your average is coming useful. However, because we have things at the, at the gigahertz level and the megahertz level, we care more about millions of instructions per second because otherwise the numbers is kind of too big to, to be to kind of handle nicely so anyways then there was some stuff about geometric means and there's benchmarking the same stuff that i was mentioning with the spec people um the latest one that the book mentions is spec cpu 2017 which is uh introduces an additional experimental metric that enables measurement of power consumption while running the benchmark giving users insight between performance and power. So as you can see, that's for when you're like overclocking probably. So anyways, but that's pretty much chapter two. And so the, the biggest sort of practical thing to remember from this is to, to be able to compute Amdahl's law and cycles per instruction and uh, millions of instructions per second, because that's what we will check you on. I, I, don't, I don't know yet if we will make you compute like geometric mean or harmonic mean in the test yeah geometric mean maybe harmonic not really but geometric is relatively simple to do you just multiply them together and take take the root so you guys can do that you know plus you have, you have to use a calculator so um i was thinking of making a coding assignment so you could do over the weekend where you make a little calculator that computes those things but it just seemed it seemed very easy and redundant to do plus i have an idea for the next for the actual first coding assignment anyways so anyways, now we get to chapter three, which is the, what I really am interested to talk about here. Um, 
which is the uh, this whole fetching, the coding and things, and then how the, the process works, which is, I think, what I will make you do in your in your programs. So um, let's go ahead. I haven't quite looked at it yet, but I'm assuming that the PowerPoint has some interesting things about it. If not, I was I was reading this uh, last night to just make sure that I was fresh on the material. Uh, let's see. First of all, the picture that we're really going to work on is this picture because this is the kind of stuff that you should know. Now this, maybe you know this from assembly for the most part. And I kind of went over this, but uh, I think let's go ahead and start. Well, let's start with the basic one here. Yeah, let's do this one. Okay, so... Um, yeah, you lose some C++ coding. Don't worry, it's not going to be like drill to. Um, so, anyways, this is going to get more complicated as we go through. In fact, today it'll get more complicated. But eventually, once we throw everything in, in, the, in into place, pipelining will make more sense as to why it's good. So, uh, this is all kind of building up to pipelining. But first, to understand how even pipelining works, we need to understand how this whole how the process of feeding stuff to your CPU works, basically. And so, in the most basic, simplest sense, you know, when you need to do something with your with your with your processor, what you need to do is you need to tell it what you want to do, right? And then it does it. And so that's the most basic instruction cycle: is you're gonna fetch what an instruction, so basically what you want the processor to do, and then you execute it, and then it's done. Okay? So that's the most 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 basic thing. However. That's that's sort of like the the way you tell you tell somebody not in CS like yo you know this this thing is going to tell it something and then it's going to do it. However, we know that there's more to it than that, and so I'll skip to this picture because this picture is already kind of giving you the different flow of that. So the way that things really do work is you have an instruction, and what does an instruction look like? Um, here, you have an opcode. And you have an address. An opcode is going to be the in, the instruction per se of the operation that you want to do. In fact, opcode probably stands for operation code. And so, what operations can you do? Well, I know the TA went over that IIS example. So there's things like loading, storing, multiplication, just whatever on the set. All the assembly stuff that you learn, those are all going to be your opcodes. Those are all your instructions that you can run, right? And so, um, the address on, is going to be what you're doing that instruction on uh, now they don't all have to have addresses per se uh, but most of them pretty much do uh, i suppose if you get to some uh, more advanced architecture like x86 you can load something into two registers like predefined registers and then call like multiplication or divide on that and then it'll 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 do the division on that but most of the time if you think of something like risk architecture then yes, you, you will have an address associated with every opcode. So anyways, uh, here's, here you have an example of, you know, let's just, because this will come in useful when we do the other example is, we're going to say that instruction, we have four, four, uh, four, bit, four bits, four bytes, no, four bits, four bits. We have four bits for our, our opcodes, which means that how, how many instructions can we keep if we have four bits for the, uh, for the instructions, the opcodes? So what is what is the answer to that? That's that's not too hard. How many instructions can we have? You could use a single number per each individual instruction, right? Like I can say instruction zero is something, instruction one is something else, instruction two is something else. Two to the fourth. Yes, very good. Two to the fourth. So you could have 15, but you could also, I guess you could have 16 because you could also have something in instruction zero, right? It goes from zero to 15. So you have 16 potential numbers, right? And so, yes, yeah, it would be two to the two to the power of how many bits you have. So you have four, it's two to the two to the fourth, essentially. So yes, 16. Good. Cool, cool, cool. Um, so, okay, that's that's the opcode. Now the address is going from from uh, from from actually, you know, the way that it's listed here is a little bit misleading because it says uh, zero to three and then four. So it almost makes it seem like there's only three bits here, but then they show four here. So I don't know which one they kind of going with, but I was going with the four four bits here. But yeah, um, sketchy how they did that. But anyways, 
Oh, no, I, I see, I see. Indices. These are indices, how they put it. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. They're indices, like how they, they did that. Okay. So that make, okay, that would make sense. Cool, cool. Thank you. So let me go from indices 4 to indices 15. Yeah, okay, cool. So now that is going to be your address. Now, how much is that going to be? That's going to be um, basically 4 minus the 16 that we have, so 12. So whatever 2 to the 12 is, that's going to be the number of addresses you can have from memory. Okay? And then the kind of the numbers that we're going to be working with are going to be integers, which is just your regular old integer. However, this one's a little bit special because it's going to be a 16 bit integer in the sense that the first bit is your sign bit. So it's whether it's a positive or negative, it's a sign integer. And then the other uh, 15 of them are going to be your actual number. So the biggest number that you can keep would be what would be the and if you guys got it right on the address, you can keep 4000 addresses. But what's the biggest number that an integer can keep before it overflows? Signed or unsigned? Well, there's a there's a little remember I just said there's that first bit right there. That first bit has to be zero or one, it has a little s. So this is a signed integer. I should get like Jeopardy music, like two to the 15th. Yes, two to the 15th is indeed correct because there's 16 bits, but one is for the sign bit. So that gives you 15. No, no, why are you putting two to the 15th? No, 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 because two to the 16th would be if it was unsigned. So two to the 15th is actually correct. Not, not two to the 15th minus one, so yeah, two to the 15th. Okay, so what is that in practical terms? I don't know, that's probably somewhere around like 15,000, maybe? I don't know. What, what is that? Somebody throw that in a calculator and tell me what it is, 2 to the 15th. And now 2 to the 10, I think, is 1024. So then that would be 12. So so I think... Oh, 32,000. Okay, so I was off by 1. So, yeah, so 32,000. Yeah, so that means that it, uh, 2, to the, uh, 2 to the 14 would have been about 15,000 or 16,000. So, yeah. Oh, cool, cool, cool. There's a trick to remember that, like... If you're, I think two to the ten is ten th is, is is basically a thousand twenty four. So you start counting again from there one, because then it goes to two, four, eight. So yeah, it's just it's early in the morning to do that. Uh, no, this is technically a two byte integer because one byte is eight bits, right? And so this is this is it's almost two byte integer. Well, yeah, it is because of the sign bit. So yeah, this is a two byte integer. Okay, if you think of it in that term, not a four byte integer. Uh, that would be a, that would require us to have uh, 32 bits. Why would the integer format be sine magnitude instead of two's comp? Uh, let's talk about two's comp once we complement. By the way, when we get to that, all right. But it's because it's just the way that our machine we decided to set it up. Okay. We will talk, I think we do talk about when we talk, we, we talk about compliments and then we also talk about, um, if I remember this from my own 219, we talked about Hoffman's code. So we'll talk about Hoffman's algorithm and maybe I'll make you guys code that one as well when we get there. But yeah, 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 you talk about this in CPE as well too. So, but I think it's on the book or at least it wasn't because when I, when I took this class, I had an older book. And uh, in fact, when they mentioned about the clock computing being at the end of the chapter one, it actually kind of rang a bell from back then. I think they just got rid of that section. But um, yeah, so that so that kind of rang, rang a little bit of a bell. And uh, I do remember talking about Hoffman's code for the first time because they didn't talk about it um, before. And I knew about it by the time that I took 302. So yeah. Um, but anyways. So, uh, okay, so this is kind of what we're gonna be working with, okay? So we got that opcode and then we got our address. And some of the, uh, some of the, uh, the, 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 the things that we want to, um, to keep in mind are that PC stands for program counter. And what does that actually do? Okay, when you're running your program, you know, you, you, you have your code, which, you know, your C++ becomes assembly code or machine code. And then it goes from top to bottom, right? Think of each line number in your assembly code as 
what the program counter is going to go through. So if you have a piece of code that says do this, do this, do this, do this, then the program counter is going to tell you, it's going to, it's going to basically be an offset and say, okay, where in memory is my first instruction? Okay. And then it's going to assume that the instruction beneath that is actually the second instruction of the program. And then it's going to be uh, the correct assumption to make. Okay. So if your program counter is at 300, which I think is what they use in the example there, then the next instruction to run will be 301, which will be the next instruction in your assembly code. Now, if you have a jump statement or some sort of go to or whatever, you know, branching or in, in that case, your program counter can be changed, but that the go to statement or the jump is going to tell it what to change to. But it's always going to try to go one increase by one each time okay so that's going to be your program counter does the instruction register is going to load the next instruction from the from the uh for program and how does it know which one to load whatever the program counter is pointing to okay and then our accumulator is just sort of a register or temporary storage okay so that is all gonna build out to the big example that i want to do uh, this one okay so we got our program counter here let me let me zoom in. We got our program counter, we got our accumulator, and we got our, our instruction register. And we, I can do another custom example as well. But first I wanna go over this one on the book because uh, you might not get it. And this is again from page uh, 78 in the book, section 3.2, which is I think the most important section of chapter three that you, you want to make sure that you, uh, I know you all read it all, but I want to make sure you reread that, okay? Because uh, it made sense to me because I actually, I, I was like, oh, okay, this all rings a bell. But it, when I, I think the first time I learned it, it was a little bit tricky to actually understand this example. It's a little bit uh, interesting uh, per se. Now, before we can really understand that, let's go ahead and look at what the steps are which we kind of said but let's just picture why okay so we need to calculate the address of the instruction okay that's going to be our first step so what we're going to do is we're going to take the program counter you know and basically find in memory where that is now right now we're saying that they're matching here but that may not be the case in reality there might be some sort of offset some uh, arithmetic offset because because you know this might be stored in memory 45 you know per se and the 45 is a 300, then 301 will be 46 per se, okay? So that is going to be the instruction address calculation, okay? Next, you're going to fetch the instruction from memory. And this, by the way, don't forget we have caching. So right now we're sort of saying as if we didn't. But if we have caching, then uh, hopefully this stuff is in our cache. If not, then we're gonna miss it and we're gonna have to look in memory and it's gonna be slow. For right now, we're just kind of removing the cache side just to simplify the process, okay? So anyway, we're gonna get that instruction. So that means we're gonna fetch the instruction, which is this 1940, that's literally the instruction that if, remember how we got split, is this is gonna be, each of these numbers is is uh, is, 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 is going to be, uh, the, the three numbers here represent the address, and then this is gonna be the opcode, okay? This number here, just, just the way they set this up, okay? We're going with this, but here they, instead of putting it in binary, they, they sort of put it in decimal-ish per se, uh, and they're using decimal instead of hex for the addressing, which is why you have 940. Although I could lie and say that's hex, that actually would work as hex too, but no, you know, they're probably using decimal. And then this is gonna be the opcode, okay? This is the instruction. One, what is that instruction? That is gonna to be to load, into the accumulator, whatever is in that memory address. So this is gonna say load address 940 into the accumulator. So that's actually what we're gonna to get to. But before we do that, again, back to this. So that's the instruction fetching. Now, notice that I had to look at this one and then go over here to tell you that it meant load accumulator from memory. The processor is gonna do basically the same thing. It's gonna look inside into its little list of what each binary value represents in, in the opcode and actually figure out what it has to do. So it looking up and saying it's supposed to load something, that's gonna be your instructor operator decoding, okay? So that's that's translating the binary into the, into, into, the, into the processor's own internal sort of understanding that it means that it needs to load. So it's a little lookup, you know, it has to see, okay, the the uh, the one represents that it, that it has to feed the data through this pathway in the, uh, you know, of, of, uh, of the chip, which is the instruction, okay? So from there, you know, 
we are, we're assuming that all instructions, again, have this idea of an opcode and an address, and this is a, the architecture that we're working with. And because of that, then um, we're going to have to fetch whatever is in that address. So that is the operand address ca calculation. So why is it a calculation? Because again, things may be offset, okay? In this case, it's, again, it's, it's sort of skipping that step by saying address 940 is address 940 here. The reality of that is not, that is not gonna be matching per se. Because while virtually, yes, it's address 940, in reality, this could be anywhere in RAM. And so it's gonna to be together, but it could be anywhere. And because of that, there might be an offset. This might actually be address 1000 and 9001 per se. And so because it's 9001, you know, you can, you can say, here, let me switch over to the iPad. I lost my mouse. <laughs> here we go. You know, I can say that address 940 is equivalent to my ongoing right now of 9001. That means that 941 is going to be 9002. 942 is 9003. What would be, if there was an address 940, 939, what would that be, guys? Nine thousand. Yay. Okay, good. Just want to make sure you guys are awake, you know. So yeah. Okay. So uh this offset, you know, it only has to kind of keep track of one, probably the first instruction. Um but uh actually sorry, well not instruction in this case, but first address, you know, it's probably gonna keep things together. But the process of doing this, this is of course sort of a very simple one, but this is from virtual addressing to like the physical addressing. It can get it, it can get more complicated than this, um as I think we will talk about, and if not, then I'm for sure that they will talk about in 370. There's like different types of addressing system, but I think that we will talk about it in the book, but you actually get to code it and things like that in 370. So uh, 370 is like the follow-up when they get into like the hardcore stuff. That's the class that I hope to teach one day. Uh, so yeah, anyways, so that is going to be what they consider here on this on the on the little table here as the address uh, calculation. Okay, so there any whatever calculation needs to happen to convert that into the actual physical address location happens here. Okay, again we're we're removing the concept of caching, but in caching we would also keep that address so that it knows that this is where that address came from, and then it would you know we'll be able to do that. But if so, and that's what's happening in the operand fetch. So the operand fetch is gonna get, once it gets the address of whatever it's dealing with, so that 940, it's gonna actually go to memory and get that 940. So in this case, we're gonna go to the RAM and, and fetch it. Uh, if there was a cache, then we would check there first to see if it's there in the L1 cache. And if it's not there, then we check the L2 cache. And if it's not there, if we have an L3 cache, we check that as well. And if it's not there, then we check in memory. Now, if it's not in memory, which is a possibility, then you check in the hard drive. And if it's not there either, then uh, that's when you, uh, you're you like, what the heck? And then you probably crash or something because it should be there unless you got an invalid memory because you, uh, you broke your pointers or something. So yes, yeah, basically just give up. Uh, trick question. No, it wasn't a trick question. Uh, anyways, so here you see the sort of double going back and forth with the multiple operands because Again, if we had a more complicated architecture, you may be able to load two things at once. So like, it might be possible that, um, switch, we could have something like opcode address, and then this was split into like two addresses. But again, it wouldn't really work here because uh, we may not be able to access, if, you know, if, the, if there's 4,000 addresses and we're trying to access two things and both things are an address like 5,000 or something, then that's not really gonna work. Uh, so anyways, if we, we had a, a bigger, um, instruction format, then we could in theory, keep two addresses together. Right. And, and that's kind of X86 and those kind of things. And we'll have those, those, those sort of things in there. So that might be what is happening here when you're saying multiple operands. Okay. It's fetching all the addresses, but in this case, we're keeping it simple one address. So we just fetch that. Okay. Now, again, this, this is a complicated process because it's got to look for it but once it finds it then it brings it down into the accumulator okay or, or whatever register you're working with which in the most basic sense is an accumulator uh and then we do the actual uh operation that that, that the op the opcode told us to do if there's any 
Uh, it, it, there's some uh, some instructions that are like load something. Then there's no real operation that needs to be done. But um, if if it's something like add, which we'll do the example of, then you would do that as well. Okay. Then um, if the inst the instruction, this is also optional too, because then you're done. At this point, you could be done. After you load something, you could be done. The other scenario is you could do an operation with something that you currently have loaded somewhere else. The other scenario is you might have to store something. It might actually store something in memory. And if that's the case, then again, you got to get the address where you're supposed to store it and then actually store it. So this could be optional um, depending on if that's what you're doing. Okay, these two. So again, you, you go from here with the operand fetch, but at this point, you might just load it into, into the accumulator and that could be the entire instruction. Another scenario could be where you're supposed to not just load it into accumulator, but maybe you have to add it to what's on the accumulator currently. So that would be what happens there. And the other scenario is after doing this, you may actually require to uh, to store something. It's a save function or sorry, save instruction. Then you have to get that address where you're supposed to store and then actually store it. And the way that this is communicated is through these two buffers that they talked about earlier, which are the memory address buffer and then, uh... oh, no, it's not there. Here we go. The MAR and the MBR, memory address register and memory buffer register. Those are the two big ones, the important ones. So your program counter here, instruction register, your execution unit, that's, that's think of that like where that the process is happening, like the ALU basically. Um, and then um, your memory address register, which is the one that, that, that tells you where uh, where the op, the op operand is at, and then the memory buffer register, which is where it's kind of loading things before they feed their, they're fed in. But that memory buffer register is the one that you communicate with the memory. And in between here, you would put in your, uh, your cache, like right, right here. And then your system bus is the, the line that runs. Okay. And again, that's the one that usually bottlenecks nowadays because we need something wider. Um, there's also IO as well, but we'll get there. So anyways, now let's go. Now that we know all of that, I think we can actually go on full for this example. Uh, let's, uh, I kind of want to put it on the iPad so I can draw, but what I can do is I can use the snipping tool in windows. Do that. So I think we'll do that. Give me a second. Okay, so uh, th that'll work, yes. Okay. So what we got is this right now. We're working here, okay? So right now, it program counter says that the next instruction to execute is instruction 300 in our program. So that's the 300th instruction in our program, okay? So Let's go ahead and fetch that instruction from memory. So that's first step one. So fetch instruction this. So that there has to be any sort of conversion, which again, here we're saying there's no necessary, but there might be. We're gonna go into, into memory 300 or whatever the conversion is. You know, we say 300, but there might be some magical here because this might actually be stored at address 9,000, right? So there's that conversion that has to happen there. But here they're not, they're saying there's no conversion, okay? Because it's a, to keep it simple, okay? So we go ahead and we fetch that. That's 1940. And we go ahead and we put it in the instruction register, which is the next thing to execute. Okay. From there, two things are going to happen between steps one and step two. First of all, you're going to go ahead and execute that instruction that you just loaded. But also, do not forget to increase your program counter. In fact, I would recommend that. Technically, internally, what would happen is you would increase the program counter first, then do the instruction because the instruction might change the program counter itself. You know, it might. If it's a if it's a go to statement per se, then it will change your program counter. So uh, if you if you if you change the if you if you if you run the instruction first and then run and then increase the program counter by one, your go to statements might be off by one line of code. Okay, so it, you can see how that would get kind of messed up. So increase the program counter and then run the instruction. We'll go with that. Okay. So from there, that is, uh, we're gonna go ahead and run this instruction. So what is this? Okay, well, uh, if we remember here, 
instruction one is supposed to be the load accumulator from memory. So that means load into the accumulator whatever the operand address has. Okay? So we have 940. That's our operand address. So what we're going to do is, first of all, um, we are, we're going to decode, as we just did, that one represents load. So that is the uh, operand decoding. So that's this, that's, uh, that's this step here, instruction operator decoding, the one that we're working with, okay? Tell me, tell me if you get lost, okay? I'm trying, I'm trying to, to go as slow as possible here, okay? Uh, okay, so um, what, what, I, what I get lost is I keep losing the mouse because it becomes a dot when I go over there. It's really annoying. But anyways, so we go ahead and we decode that we have to load. So that is sort of the process first. We have to load, load. And then we need to load address 940. So again, that is going to be an address potentially uh, decoding in the sense that it might not be the same address. It's calculation, not decoding, sorry. Calculation. So that's this step here now. Open our address calculation. We are comp calculating that. Again, in this scenario here, there's, there's no real calculation because it's just saying it's 940. But internally, there might be, again, because it's not really 940. That's just, a, that's just what we see but it's not the real address where things are kept, okay? So uh, <clears throat> we go there and we find that address 940 or whatever the, the real equivalent is has the value of three, okay? Because we are, we are loading that, we're not loading it as an address, we're loading it as a integer, then we basically, well, at this point it's an action, it actually doesn't matter. We don't we don't care whether where it's an address or an integer. We're just loading it, which means we're just copying it into the into the accumulator. Yeah, yeah. So forget I said that, David. So because uh, this could actually work for for pointers as well. So we just literally copy the contents, whatever they are, identical to the accumulator. Okay. So that is going to be our operand fetch. Okay. Okay. It's so annoying to lose the mouse. Operand fetch right here. Okay. So. There we go. Okay, so from there we uh, we can now con con sort of conclude the uh, the instruction that we just executed, and then the program counter, as you see, goes up. Okay, so now we're at three hundred one. So the next thing we got to do is start the cycle again. So at that point, you know, there was no data operation per se, and nothing necessarily here. Okay, so from there we go back all the way to the beginning and go and. Uh, I guess in here it's missing the program counter in, program counter increase from that little picture there, but program counter did one up. Okay, so now we're at step three. So step three says uh, we got the program counter three hundred one, and we're going to go ahead and load that from memory. So that's going to be our instruction address calculation. We're going to figure out what three hundred one is in memory, which you know there it is. But again, it could be something completely different. But it's going to be whatever different plus one per se. And then uh, it's going to copy that content. Again, it doesn't look at what the content really is. It just copy paste per se <laughs> from 301 into the instruction register. Okay, so that's our instruction fetching. So it copies the 5941 into the IR register, which is going to replace the old value of 1940, which we no longer need because that's the old instruction. Okay, now that we've fetched it, we're going to go ahead and uh, figure out what that instruction is. So that's going to be our Oper, uh, instruction operator decoding that one okay and so what is five well let's go ahead and look five is and again this is of course depending on your architecture and whatever but you know you have some chart that tells you these things and so we can see that the bottom one one zero one I'm going to assume that's five um, and it says add to accumulator from memory what that means or what I think it means is that Whatever the uh, opcode is, which is going to be five, there's going to be an address to that. That address is, we got to take that as an integer and add it to whatever we currently have in the accumulator. And if remember, we have, I think, a two, I think it was a two or a three. What was it? It was a three. We have a three in the accumulator. So we're going to load from memory whatever's in the address and add that to the three. Okay. Now, it doesn't say anything about... Um, this is, I guess, it kind of skipped saying this, but we're going to store the result of the addition in the accumulator itself. Okay, so we're going to override it. That's not that's not really said here, but that's what we're going to do. Okay, that's part of our 
computer architecture. Not the organization, because the organization is how actually this addition would get done, right? The, or the, how, how, how it's done behind the scenes. We're talking about the architecture right now. So, anyways, um, okay, we're gonna do work. So, 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 so we already did the operator decoding. We said that that is going to be, let's go ahead and put it here. Please, where are you? Here we go. Okay, add. Add, okay. And then um, this is the address. So now we're gonna do the operand address calculation. So that is going to be address 941, which again, it just happens to be in this example, they were next to each other, but it could be anywhere in memory, um, to be honest. Usually though, what ends up happening is the very, you know, this is probably a function in some code or something, and lo the local variables are kept together, probably. And so that's kind of why uh, they're next to each other, but they don't have to be technically, you know, I mean, they might be near each other, but they're not next to each other. That's unlikely, actually. So it has to, they would have to literally be next to each other on the line when you could declare the variables. So, yeah, I'm just trying to make sure you don't make assumptions that are not necessary here. So, anyways, 941, that, uh, that's our address. So we're loading two, not just load, we're adding it into the accumulator value. So we have to do the very advanced computation of adding 2 plus 3. 2 plus 3 is equal to five that of course happens internally to our little lo transistors logic gates you know the, ah, just a little add alu I, i'm if you took cp100 i'm sure they made you do that in the breadboard so you know the process of that i i, I don't remember it i could probably come up with it I, or i just google it and say i came up with it so yeah anyways you get a five and you store it in the accumulator so you overwrite the tree with that okay again Behind the scenes, how that actually happened of like taking a number and adding to it and not writing it in the same spot as it was. There might be behind the scenes somewhere else where you can store the temporary variable or something, you know, cause you gotta load it in. So there's probably some other internal register we're not looking at where this is happening, you know, like in within the, uh, or within the chip, the logic of the addition, you know, you have to store somewhere that. So there's behind the scene things, but we don't care. We don't have to worry about that, okay? That's going too deep. That's going into CPE land. So anyways. We go ahead and we add the three and the two and we store it into the five. At that point, we are done with that and we're gonna go ahead and increase our program counter to the next instruction, which will be 302. So uh, yeah, the cycle repeats itself. In this case though, we did an actual data operation. So this one was operand fetch and data operation. And again, there was no operand address calculation and operand store here, okay? So uh, next, we get into the last example here, which we have program counter 302 so we're going to go ahead and do the instruction address calculation which tells us that we go to 302 because again there's no shifting here or whatever but there might be and then from there we're going to fetch that instruction so we're going to fetch 2941 and put it into the instruction register as you see here from there we are going to go ahead and do the instruction operator decoding so what is that? We look at our lookup table here. It says store accumulator to memory. So it's saying store what's in the accumulator to the address that is passed in next next to the opcode. And so uh, cool, we can do we can do that. So now that we have decoded, this is going to be S T O R. You know this is why I prefer the tablet. It's kind of painful to do, but it's okay. So. Uh, yeah, we're going to store the accumulator stuff, which is five, into address 941. That's what we got to do. And so um, that, first of all, we're going to calculate 941 and see if it's the exact 941. And it is. It just means stored in 941. So that would be uh, this one right here. So us computing this address 941 here is technically, I suppose, a... Uh, um, a computation per se um and anyways from there we are going to uh that's going to be actually this one operand address calculation so finally we're looking at something on this side here so we are computing the address 941 and then we are going to store it so that means take the accumulator five and dump it in 941 which would overwrite the two okay and that's it that's that example so uh does that make sense how do you guys feel about that 
do I have to do another example? Or maybe just actually, or, or you know what I could do is I could make the TA do, do, uh, do one on, on Friday as well. But uh, I, 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 could, I, could, I could throw in some random numbers in here and, and do a different one. So, yeah. Yeah, I'll make the TA do one. Yeah, yeah. But uh, basically, let's just say there was one more instruction here, just very fast. So uh, the next thing that would run would be what's in 303. So in 303, suppose that we wanted to, um, to add, like, to add itself, you know, 5 plus 5. Because we still have the old 5 in the accumulator, so we could do that. So the next instruction would be something like uh, 5, 9, 4, 1. 5, 9, 4, 1 in this scenario would add 5 to the current 5. Because the 5, you know, we, we, we decode the 5 means addition. And then uh, 9, 4, 1. So first of all, we'd have 303, spot 303 in memory here would have 5, 9, 4, 1. Okay? I know that doesn't look like a 9, but it's a 9. Okay? So we'd copy that here, 5941, and then from there, we would go here to 941, which currently has a 5, because that's what we stored here, and then we would put it in into the uh, into here by adding it, because that's the operation add. So then this would have a 10. And then we could store it in, so our instruction 304 could be to store it back into 941 or 940. So yeah, but anyways, I'll make the, I'll make the TA do one. I'll, I'll come up with one and then just give it to him. Um, also, I'm sure there's a plenty of those in the uh, in the in the site in the like in the examples like in the homework programs and the, not the homework the end of the chapter questions so uh, I can him pick one from those because then he has a solution so he doesn't mess it up or something so if not it's they're not too bad so anyways they are indeed easy they are very easy to do once once you get practice with them but of course you know we're gonna make it more complicated because that's what we do in CS we increase the complexity of things to try to make things better. Uh, not always being successful. So that's when we're going to be talking about interrupts. So interrupts uh, is going to be basically the second part of the uh, of chapter of section 3.2 even. We literally just went over like four pages, but it's important that we get that. So uh, interrupts, that starts on page 81. And so, uh, so, so let's talk about IO for a second here. You know, suppose that while we're running this stuff here, you know, uh, one of the instructions was to write to memory. I'm oh, sorry, not, not to memory, my bad, my bad. To write to an I.O. device, like to print something out of the screen, okay? When you're going to do that, there's two ways that you can do it. One of the ways is you, you send it, you send, you know, you load to the accumulator the one that says, like, let's say instruction six was to write what's in the accumulator to, to an I.O. device, like the terminal, okay? So it could be something like uh, six, um, and then let's say 841. 841, even though it's an address here, we'll just say that that's actually the address of the IO device or something, something like that. Not quite like that, but let's just go with that, okay? So what that operation says is write to that, to that IO device. And so you at that point can, you know, if you're just following this, this example here, that you're waiting for that DAR operation to finish before you can come, come, come go to the next uh, uh, instruction, right? So the, increase your program counter and go on. IOs are slow. You know, printing out to the terminal takes a long time because like you have to tell the OS like, yo, please, I need to print this out. You know, can you take care of it? And he's like, you know, I'll take care of you, but I got other people here in line. So you got to wait your place in line and I got to handle this people's like DMB style, okay? And so it will take time, a lot of time. Like we're talking about like a lot of lost clock cycles. One of the things you can do in the easiest implementation is you just sit there and wait. You know, you wait for your turn. Alternatively, you, if you know, if you brought your book with you to the DMV, you can read your book so you can get your homework done while you're waiting for your turn, right? So essentially, you could do other things that don't require you to wait for that. And what could be the other things you can do? You can pretty much do anything you want as long as it's not something that requires a DMV because. If you require the DMV or require the, the I.O. device, you know, then you got to wait because you can't, they won't let you submit two things at once. You know, they'll only let you process one thing at a time. And you got to wait for that thing to finish before you can send something else. So you can do anything else in the, in the computer and do any other computations. But if you try to print a second thing out, 
then you gotta wait for the first one to finish before you send the second one, right? That's the simplest term that will be without interrupts. The other scenario is, um, or sorry, the simplest the simplest term without interrupts will be just to you sit there and wait for your turn. But if you are multitasking, then that will be the second scenario, which is with interrupts. With interrupts being when your number gets called, you say, uh, you know, uh, what do they say? Number five six one. You know, please go to window six. That is an interrupt because you're being interrupted uh, by the sort of announcer and saying your turn has happened. So now you can stop whatever you're multitasking and then go and, uh, and, and do your process with the DMV. And at that point, you might give it something else to do. Like, you know, you're getting your license. You got to you gotta first do the, do the, do the, do the, uh, like the test and then you got to get the picture taken or something. Or if you're paying your registration, you know, you might have to first get a form and then, you know, uh, pay and then show the bill back to them, which now you can do everything electronically, but something like that. And so that will be a form of an interrupt. As since when you have an interrupt is basically your ability to continue doing other things, but then when finally it's your turn, when the printing is done, you get interrupted and saying the printing is done. I'm ready to take more stuff. Okay. So that's kind of what we're looking at. And that's what this picture, which is look really complicated, but especially because it's the third one I think is not useful. So just really only look at the top two um, of what, of what this process is. So we got a program and first you see this part of the, look, look at my mouse right there. That's just code. Just, just code that is unrelated to writing. Okay. Then you have a write command, you know, to the IO, you have something to give to the DMV to do. Then you got more code. Then you got a second write command. So more, printing to the terminal or another task to the DMV. Then you got more code. And then you got, I suppose, just the rest, ignore the second, the third write, okay? Just more stuff happens after that. So in the simplest format, when you get to the write command, your program, you know, you stop, you tell the IO, this is what you want it to do. Print this out or uh, please renew my registration DMV. Then the IO has to run its own code. So this is behind the scenes, the, 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 uh, the DMV is, uh, you know, ideally in the best case scenario, if you're the only person there, you know, they would immediately take you up and then go ahead and actually uh, do whatever they require. So this is the actual code that gets the code print, that gets whatever you want to print, print it out. This is the actual internal code of the IO device that prints things out. Or in the DMB case, this is them typing into their machine, whatever they got to type, printing whatever they got to print, and then actually giving you what you want. So when giving you what you want is when it ends, and then you can continue going on your merry way until you get to another write, at which point again, you stop, you tell the IO what you want to do, IO program, then the IO does its own thing, and then it finishes, and then you come back, and then you keep going, okay? So that's the simplest term when you're waiting for it. We don't wanna wait for it, we want to just kinda tell it to do its thing and then keep going if we can, so that's the second picture here, that's with an interrupt. So you're running code, then you get to a write. You tell the IO program, hey, I need you to do this printing for me. The only part that you're going to do of this IO program is just the part where you're just giving it like getting your number for the DMB or just telling it what to write. But you're not going to wait for the internal IO commands to happen and anything that needs to be done before it gets printed. You're going to keep going. At some point as you're going, you're going to get interrupted. You're going to be like, yo, I'm done. I finished printing. So at that point, you stop execution of the program and you handle that interruption. So that is basically, you know, you listening, you know, to the, your number comes up in the DMB and you actually go and uh, get whatever you finished, you know, you get your, you get your license finally or something, and then you go back to writing, okay? Or in the case of, of printing out, you know, it tells you printing successful, you know, we're ready to go for the next one. And then uh, you're like, okay, thanks. And then you keep going. You get to another write, yet again, you tell like, hey, IO, I need you to print this out. So you, you tell it all you need to print out, you process that with the IO, the IO accepts it, and it's like, okay, here you go, I'm ready to go, go on. And then you keep going on your merry way, at some point here, then uh, you get stopped by the IO, and it's like, hey, hey, I'm done. Okay, thank you, thank you, okay, now I can keep going, okay? Now, this is the ideal scenario because, you know, this amount of code processing that you did is what you gain versus here. So here, you know, you would already be here by the time this gets here. And if we, uh, if you go, I'm sure there's a picture of that. On the book, they have a picture of this. This is like, this is a sort of a quote unquote to scale 
of running something with an IO and without. Okay, so this think of it like in, time, in terms of time, the length of the lines is time. So the green code is just code without any IO. And then at the end of the green code, you have a write operation. So the gray stuff is basically the, 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 the first part of the IO, which is the uh, IO program part. That's when you're telling it like, hey, I need you to do this printing for me. And then it's like, okay, I'll, I'll take care of it. And then you wait, if, this, if you're not doing interrupts, you wait. This is the IO telling you, hey, I'm done. You're like, okay, thanks. More normal code, another print statement. This is you preparing the IO for what you need to print, waiting for it to get done. The IO telling you it's done, and then you can keep going. Now with an interrupt, you know, you're running this, you stop because you got to print, you still got to tell the IO what to print, but then instead of waiting, you start running the second part of the code. And then finally you get interrupted here by the IO telling you it's done and you're like, okay, thanks, thanks fam. And then you keep going. And then you got, you basically reached the end of this. You got another write operation. Then um, you tell the IO that, but you don't wait for it. You keep going. At some point in the middle of this green one, it stops you. It tells you it's done. You're like, okay, thanks. And you keep going. You can see that this second one is a lot shorter than that. So that's the amount of time you saved. Okay. However, that's ideal scenario. The reality, just like in DMB, is uh, that you might actually end up having to do multiple things at once. And you still got to wait for the first one to finish where you can keep going. So uh, here's a scenario of that situation. Without interrupts, we are running code. Uh, we again tell the IO to do something. The IO does it. We wait for it. We finish. Then we do more. IO, please do IO, finish IO, and that. So that's a long one, right? Okay. So this is the scenario where the IO time is just a long time and we actually don't have anything to do before it. So this scenario is like, again, we're running our code. We tell the IO to do something and then we're like, we don't wait for it. We do task two. However, when we finish task two, we have another write operation, but the IO hasn't finished with the first one. At this point, we're stuck. We gotta, we can't tell the IO like, here's another write. We gotta actually wait for the first write to finish, okay? Now, in reality, there's a buffer and things like that to avoid this sort of situation, but that's if you're writing. But suppose, you know, we switch it around. You're reading. If you're reading, you know, you, you might actually never be able to wait at all. You might actually need something in before you can even keep going. That's a possibility, okay? So it, it, it depends really on the IO that you're doing, whether you have to wait or not, okay? But let's say that you actually do have to wait. In this case, uh, you can't do a second IO until the first one finishes. The IO might not even let you take a second one. The DMB is not gonna let you have two tickets at once, probably. They're gonna be like, you gotta finish the first one before the second one. And so when you get here, you know, you already finished but you and you're waiting for the second one, but now you actually gotta wait, 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 Finally, it tells you the first one is done. Immediately, he's like, okay, don't even go. I have another one for you. And then you can send it to go on its merry way. And then uh, you finish step three, which you will be done, but you still got to wait for the IO to finish. So then you wait, 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 and finally receive it. So even in this scenario, you still gain a little bit of efficiency, at least with the first write. The following writes, you know, may not gain efficiency if, uh, if you're just waiting for it. But uh, you can still see that there's a little bit of an advantage, you know. You can see one of them is shorter than the other one. Okay, so uh, go ahead and read it in the book again if you if you if you need uh, help on that. If not, I can try to mention it next time. Uh, the last the, so so basically that's how I O that's how interrupts work. But the last thing I want to show you is there's two kind of interrupts that you can do because here's the thing, we get into interrupt inception. Okay, suppose that you have multiple possible interrupts that you might have, and in the book they have an example where they have uh, the printer interrupt. You have a communication interrupt and you have a disk interrupt. So what is this, what's, what could this be in reality? Is uh, you could have like a IO, like print something to the terminal. You have something coming in from the internet, like a, like a, like a message or something if you're playing a game. And you could have something from the hard drive that takes a long time to run. So like when I finally get something from it, you're like, please send it to me because I got more stuff to do. So this I might not have enough time. So I think I'll, I'll go over this example next time. But in summary, when you have multiple tiers of interrupt, there's two ways to handle it. One is when your interrupt happens, you let it finish first, and then you do the next interrupt like this. And then interrupt inception is the interrupt gets interrupted by a higher priority interrupt, which gets interrupted by a higher priority interrupt, which may not get interrupted by another interrupt because that one's low priority, but will interrupt the one before that. So this gets into interrupt inception. So I'll, I, I think I don't want to rush this one. So I'll talk about this one next time. 
But uh, yeah, yeah, the book can be a little bit confusing for this stuff because it's a lot of information to digest and it's hard to actually explain this in text. Like, think about it. Like, how, how could you explain this, this whole arrowing situation in text? You know, that's, that's a tricky thing to do. So I sympathize with them for that. But uh, yeah, yeah, we'll talk about interrupt inception next time. So anyways, for the last four minutes, what I'm thinking of making you guys uh, code is going to be sort of this little, this sort of, uh, where is it? This sort of thing. Like we can do, we can, we can code a, uh, a mini sort of operation fetch decoding and thing. And you can, you can, you, you know, this, this should be relatively simple. You can make these all be string variables if you want or uh, inte integers that you treat as, no, no, integers is not a good one. I think strings might be the easiest thing to do. And then uh, basically we're gonna sort of mimic this sort of process in the computer because then when we get a pipelining, then you can pipeline your implementation. So I'll set this up and this will be your, your, your stuff to do over the weekend more than likely. Um, and then we can even throw in into that system the interrupt handling as well. So. That's what we'll do for, for the programming. So we'll build that and then we'll build on top of that. We'll add more features. And then maybe by the end of the, the uh, summer semester, you'll have a little mini working sort of uh, computer per se, like emulation of a computer. So yes, that's, that's the, uh, that'll be the goal of the homework. So any, any other questions about that? It's a lot of information to digest today. Uh, in terms of reading, well, you, sh you should have read all of chapter three. So, um, I'm not really going to talk about much in class about 2.6 and 3.5. Uh, 2.6 is the one with the uh, PCI, I think. Or uh, no, is it 3.5? 3.6 is PCI, and then 3.5 is uh, point to point. Yeah, so 3.5, 3.6, I won't really talk much about. I'll go briefly over them, and then you should have read them already, anyways. So uh, for tomorrow. Yeah, this this is a thick, thick one. So um, let's see how much this is to read. Realistically, I don't think I'll get past four point one. Um, I, I, I will try and read all the way to and, and tell you. I would say, since you have read chapter three, anyways. Uh, Get all the way, get all the way to 4.3, and then we may not finish talking about it. But if we don't, then that's okay. You'll get less reading on tomorrow anyway. So uh, we may not even get to that. So just read it so you have it ready to go in case we get to it. And then you know, if if we start sort of falling behind enough, then one day you won't have any reading to do. So yeah, read all the way to 4.3, just in the case that we get to it. That way you. You kind of know because it's something for this example. Like it's so much better if you read it first, get confused, but then I unconfuse you, versus like I confuse you in class, but then you read it and you're still confused. So, so you know, it's it's better to read it first and then talk about it because then you can actually bring up questions too. So yes, that's the plan. Cool. So I uh, hope you learned a lot today, guys. And if not, then uh, make sure you're learning before the test. But like I said, I'll, I'll make the I'll make the TA on Friday do an example of an interrupt, which we'll talk about more tomorrow about, but still, once we do, I'll still make him do another example of interrupts, and I'll make him do another example of the really uh, complex one, because this this is something that you want to make sure you can do for the, for the test, if I, uh, if I put something like this. Uh, yes, and they are recorded, so you can definitely watch the... I had some issues over the weekend, but I think they got resolved. I had to upload like four times to get the lectures up, but now everything is up, including the discussion one. I'm going to upload immediately after class, but I hope it works again, but uh, just expect it to be around five. So if you're watching this on YouTube, then hey, it worked. I got it uploaded. So cool. Well, before I forget, I'm going to control C the chat in a minute here. I don't want to forget. And then, uh, yes. So cool. Like I said, we'll talk more about the interrupt stuff tomorrow. So. Well, have a good uh, have a good day and uh, see you tomorrow. Make sure you read. Bye. All. Yes, make sure you at least type one message today. Otherwise, you will not appear in the, the attendance script. So, bye.